In this video, we introduce and walk you through a revised rule set for Grey Army Gaming's Basic Battle System. Yes, get ready for Basic Battles version 2.0. Basic Battles, Tabletop Games to Kids. Hello gamers, Matthew here from Grey Army Gaming in lovely Fogaloon, Sweden. In April of 2020, we released a simple yet exciting rule set for wargaming that worked really well for kids between the ages of 5 and 10. As we have discovered from the positive community response, this rule set has nevertheless proved very successful among wargamers of all ages. Needless to say, we are extremely excited that this project has proven such a success. Basic Battles, however, is far from perfect. In our own playtesting over the last year and a half, we have come across several areas for improvement. And moreover, numerous viewers have written to us with very insightful suggestions for how to make this simple game system even better. As such, we have gone back to the rules and worked out a revised version, Basic Battles version 2.0. Many of the game mechanics have been left unchanged. Others have been tweaked just a little bit, such as, for example, uh, the mechanics of the movement phase. Most noteworthy, however, is that we have introduced a new mechanic for ranged attacks. The hope is that this addition contributes to the overall gaming experience without rendering the rules and gameplay too cumbersome. Well, enough talk from me. Let's go ahead and dive into the rules. The beauty of this rule set is that you don't really need much to play. With respect to figurines, you can use whatever you want. Dinosaurs, cars, Lego, dragons, D&D figures, even rocks. Anything you can get your hands on. For this rules run through, we will be using Star Wars Micro Machines, Star Wars Matchbox, and Star Wars Spaceship Battles figurines. You are going to need some dice. Each player will need two d20s for attacking and defending rolls, two d12s for movement, and several d6s for wound markers. And you'll need some measuring devices. Tape measures, 12 inch rulers, and 6 inch rulers are great, but any measuring device will work just fine. And finally, you will need a stable surface to play on. I recommend playing on a 3 foot by 3 foot or 4 foot by 4 foot space. Terrain and mats are great, but if you don't have any, don't worry about it. The next step is to decide how many players you want to play with. Decide how many figurines you want each player to have. The simplest way to play is to have equal numbers of figurines with equal numbers of wounds. So for example, here we have two players and each player has one, two, three, four, five figurines and we will assign each of those figurines six wounds. A more advanced way to play is to assign different wound totals to different figurines. So for example, stronger figurines may have six wounds and weaker ones may have three wounds. Important to keep in mind here, however, is that each side should have an equal number of wounds, such as 20 versus 20. In addition, the game is most balanced when each side has the same number of figurines, such as 5 of each. This will prevent one side from overrunning the other side. For additional rules concerning army building, such as how to mix melee and ranged fighters, stick around to the end of this video. Once you have all of your figurines picked out, the players roll a d20 each. The highest number gets to pick a side of the battlefield and deploy all of their figurines anywhere along the edge of the battlefield. In this case, the person who rolled the red die may begin. Following the first player's deployment, the other player deploys on the opposite side. If you have several players, deployment proceeds in descending order of the D20 rolls, each deploying on a different side of the battlefield. And if you have more than four players, divide each side into two for a potential of eight zones for deployment. After deployment, the players roll yet another D20 in order to see who begins. Highest roll starts and then moves in a clockwise fashion to the next player or players. In Basic Battles version 2.0, there are three phases to each player turn. The movement phase, 
the shooting phase, if your figurines have ranged attacks, and the combat phase. Let's walk through each of these phases in turn. The movement phase. To begin the movement phase, pick out one of your figurines to move. From the beginning, this figurine will have two D12 dice for movement. At this point, you need to make a decision concerning how many of these two dice you want to use. If you plan on shooting or charging with this figurine, remove one of the two dice from play. However, if you merely plan on moving, then keep both of them. If you plan on shooting, roll your single D12. The result is the number of inches that you may move that figurine and still be able to shoot. You do not need to move the full amount if you do not want to. If you plan on charging, declare which of the opposing figurines in your line of sight that you desire to charge, and then roll the d12. Remember, there is no pre-measuring in this game, so you need to take your best guess at the distance. 7 inches. If the number of inches rolled is sufficient to get into combat, move your figurine into base-to-base -base contact with the opposing figurine. 7 inches is enough so we can move it into base-to-base -base contact. If you come up short, simply move your figurine towards the opponent in the number of inches rolled. So for example, if we rolled 2 inches, we would simply move this ATA to 2 inches forward. Were you to declare a charge on one figurine, but the straight line ends up going through another enemy figurine, you would then clip this intervening figure and the charge would end there. This would then be the combat that will be fought in the combat phase. If you plan on merely moving and not shooting or charging, roll both of your D12s and add them together. This is the total maximum number of inches that you can move, in this case 17 inches. But remember, you don't need to move the full amount if you do not want to. Moreover, non-charging movement need not be in a straight line, but can zigzag as much as you want. Go through each of your figurines in this fashion until you have moved them all. And it is always good to place a marker on those that you have already moved so that you remember which ones have moved and which ones have not. It is also possible to move out of combat if your figurine is engaged. We will cover the rule for leaving combat later in our discussion of the combat phase. The shooting phase. Once all of the movement is finished, we now enter into the shooting phase. Each of the figurines you possess that has ranged attacks and that you have declared will fire this turn may now shoot one at a time. Begin by making sure that the figurine has line of sight on its target. If there is a line of sight, you may fire. If line of sight, however, is blocked, you may need to pick a different target. The likelihood of hitting depends on how far away the target being fired upon is. Remember, however, there is no pre-measuring in this game, so you will have to make your best guess at the distances. Once you have declared your target from this guy over to this ship, go ahead then and measure the distance to the target. If the target is within 12 inches, both you and your opponent roll 1d20. Were your roll to exceed your opponent's roll, you deal one wound of damage. As always, ties are re-rolled. If the target is further away than 12 inches to a maximum of 24 inches, you roll 1d20 for the attack and your opponent, due to the increased ability to evade the shot at longer distances, rolls 2d20s and takes the higher of the two. So in this case, we rolled a 2 over here and a 2 and a 4 over there. So we take the higher of those two, a 4. That shot misses at long distance. Were your roll as the attacker to exceed the highest roll of your opponent, you deal one wound of damage. Ties are re-rolled. And in this case, your opponent would only roll the die that tied and not both. Were your target further away than 24 inches after you have declared and measured, your ranged attack automatically misses because your target is out of range. The combat phase. 
With this, we have now come to the combat phase. The only way to fight in combat is either to charge into base-to-base -base contact with another figurine, or to remain in base-to-base -base contact. The benefit of charging is that the charging figurine always gets two attacks. We can say that this is due to momentum or the force of the charge. As such, any figure charging into combat this turn is allowed to roll two d20s for attacks. The target of the charge rolls one d20 as a defense. Each d20 of the charger that beats the defense roll of the defender causes one wound. As always, ties are re-rolled. So in this example, we got a 14 and a 3 versus a defense of 11. That means the 14 went through, causing one wound on the Millennium Falcon. Any 20 rolled by the attacker in combat is considered a critical hit and thus does a total of two wounds instead of one. Were it the case that each of these figurines were already in base-to-base -base combat at the start of the combat phase due to an earlier charge, the side attacking this turn will merely roll 1d20 and the defender will roll the usual 1d20 for defense. As we mentioned earlier in our discussion of the movement phase, it is possible to move out of combat. The reason you may want to do this is to give your figurine a more strategic position or to charge another target somewhere else on the battlefield. When leaving combat, the same rule applies for movement. If you are simply moving, roll two d12s and add this together for your maximum movement. If you are charging, declare your target and roll one d12. So for example, if it were this AT-AT's turn and it was simply moving out of this combat, it could roll 2d12 of possible movement. If however, the AT-AT wanted to move out of this combat in order to charge this X-Wing, it would only be allowed to roll 1d12 for its movement. Once you have decided to pull out of combat, the remaining opponent is given an attack of opportunity. This opponent rolls 1d20 attack die against your defense die. So in this case, the Millennium Falcon will roll 1d20, rolling a 19, and the at, -AT rolls a 2. Were your opponent to beat your roll, as in this case, you would suffer one wound. Unless, of course, your opponent rolled a 20, in which case you would suffer two wounds. Once you have pulled out of the combat, then you are able to go ahead and to make the movement roll that you have decided upon. With these three phases, the movement, the shooting, and the combat phase, you continue play between all players until only one side remains standing. This side will then be declared the winner. Alternatively, if you would like a quicker game, it is possible to set a maximum number of rounds, say five rounds. As you play, each player must keep track of the total number of wounds that he or she has caused. For example, by using a d20 counter and adding them up as you go. Each player gets a turn in each of the rounds, and at the end of the final round, you compare the number of wounds caused. The player with the highest number of wounds caused is declared the winner, with second place, third place, fourth place, etc., determined by descending order of wounds caused. One final note on army building. The simplest way to build your armies is to limit forces used to either all melee fighters, those that don't have shooting, or all melee slash range fighters, those that do have shooting. When these types of forces are mixed, it becomes more difficult to find balance, since, of course, fighters with ranged attacks will inevitably be stronger. In order to find a balance that works for you, you may need to play around with the wounds totals. One rule of thumb that has worked for me is to assign range fighters half the wounds of melee fighters and to consider these fighters equal. So, for example, let's assume that this AT-80 -AT does not have the ability to shoot. A melee fighter such as this would have six starting wounds, and a ranged fighter such as the Millennium Falcon may have three starting wounds. As such, were you to fight a melee versus ranged game, the melee team would have twice as many starting wounds. Again, depending upon fighting styles, this rule of thumb may need to be tweaked just a little bit. Well, there you have it, folks, a quick run through of the revised set of rules for Basic Battles version 2.0, a simplified tabletop game for kids between 5 and 10 years old, or for those of you who are just starting out the wargaming hobby. 
If you appreciate this kind of content, please do comment, like, and subscribe, and we will continue to produce more videos like this in the future. And most of all, thank you for joining us here today at Grey Army Gaming for the future of gaming. Ta-da!